Hello. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this institute lecture today. Um, I am very pleased to have um, uh, Dr. Ruchi Chaudhary from University of Cambridge with us today for this lecture. Um, professor Ruchi uh, is a uh, she's a professor of architecture, um, architectural engineering in the Department of Engineering at University of Cambridge. Um, her specialization is in simulation methods uh, for predicting energy demand in the built environment, uh, particularly looking at buildings, cities, and uh, large-scale infrastructure. Um, she leads multidisciplinary energy efficient cities initiative, um, and uh, she has also led the research group on digital twins uh, of built environment at the Allen Turing Institute. Um, in her talk today, she will be focusing on how data science can help us uh, inform uh, better about energy transitions um, and also linking it to policy interventions. I'm sure this is going to be an exciting talk and uh, I'm, without further delay, I'm happy to uh, ask Ruchi to, uh, to start. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anurag, and pleasure to be here and um, always uh, happy to come back. Um, I thought I'll start with giving you just sort of uh, telling you a bit more about myself, things that might not uh, be um, apparent immediately. Uh, by education, I'm an architect. I was uh, trained first in India, and then I went to grad school uh, in Michigan, USA, where I started working with um, uh, mechanical engineers with aerospace enge engineers because being interested in building physics and um, heat and mass transfer across buildings. So um, as a result, well, after that I had my first um, uh, stint at teaching at uh, Georgia Tech uh, and uh, followed by a um, uh, journey to UK in Cambridge where uh, now I teach in the Department of Civil Engineering. So. Um, and during my time at engineering, I, I led uh, and still lead a research group that is called the Energy Efficient Cities Initiative, basically a kind of multidisciplinary group that attracts students from mechanical engineering, civil engineering, from um, architecture even, and um, uh, geotech engineers as well. And I'm also um, a co i of the Cambridge Center for Smart Infrastructure and Construction, and I, um, held a three-year fellowship at the Data Centric Engineering at Alan Turing Institute. I'm telling you all of this just to give you a sense that yes, you know, in life we wear juggle many uh, sort of as a result, there's pros and cons to it. You you to learn something you have to probably unlearn something. Um, and so the common way to uh, symbolize uh, sort of many hats is Jack of all trades, master of none. And I looked it up to see that actually there's a more positive nuance to that um, uh, definition. It's somebody who knows enough from many learned trades and disciplines and is able to bring the individual disciplines together in a practical manner. And I think that in a sense is what describes my academic journey so far and what always has been my uh, uh, priority with respect to uh, research. Okay, so today I'm going to sort of give you a, a flavor of a couple of projects that we've done. One was very much situated in India. In fact, probably one of the only projects I've done which are based in um, India. And then another one in the UK following a common thread. And um, I've always been, uh, I've looked at this journey of data maturing since uh, 2005. Before that, we used to do a lot of work with physics-based models, numerical models. And then I'm seeing since 2005, 6, 8, with you know, different directives and laws coming into place, suddenly there's a release of data. Now, as engineers, we always relied on data. We always sit in the lab and measure something. If we can't measure it, we can't observe it, we can't study it. We also rely on models. But having real-life data, data from the world, which is noisy, which is difficult to work with, when that started emerging, to me that was a very exciting moment. And now we've, you know, I've seen it become better and better and better over the last uh, 15, 18 years. Um, and the potential I see here is for 
uh, data sciences to really empower what I call the traditional engineering decision making process. Why? Because we have advanced understanding of the system at a very high degree of realism as against controlled experiments in the laboratory. Uh, we also, it enables us to uh, react as timely adaptation to circumstances and bespoke um, situations. And of course, the big advantage is that the decision making process is supported with hard evidence, thus building confidence in um, uh, what we do. Now, um, across my group, the EECI, our current research interests methodologically and related to data sciences pertain to quantification of and propagation of uncertainties through computer models and uh, model calibration, thus bringing models to represent reality better. Uh, we are also very much interested in this dialogue between the models, which is the virtual process and the real world process through this uh, data thread and back and forth exchange and working with uh, uh, live data as against uh, carefully curated data. So very much interested in the uh, development of digital twins and related to that is what kind of models get are suitable for digital twins. So anything, you know, sort of emulation of computer models and physics enhanced models. And uh, pertinent to today's talk, the cross-disciplinary dialogues that it can, it does, that these systems can enable. Um, and with respect to applications across uh, my group, uh, we are currently um, uh, working on four main uh, areas. One is subsurface energy. How do we make uh, sustainable um, use of underground resources for energy, for transportation, etc.? But we basically focus on energy, that uh, in particular ground source systems, but at very large scales. Uh, we've been uh, developing the work on digital twin. We've been developing in uh, in relation to urban agriculture, uh, urban integrated agriculture, so that it's embedded within the urban fabric and uh, within a controlled environment. So we've been working quite a bit with hydroponic farming. Um, and of course, stochastic energy models of energy use in buildings, finding efficiencies, um, finding pathways uh, to uh, transitioning to decarbonization, and in UK uh, at the moment, looking into electrification of heat. Uh, we also work on energy planning, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we study energy planning from the perspective of embedding district scale and community scale energy systems, which is basically a mix of different technologies working together synergistically. Uh, for example, you have power generation on top of buildings, um, storage on site, a network that distributing uh, cooling and heating across uh, buildings, um, and how to manage them, how to manage the dispatch and the generation most efficiently. But you know, that's how I started when I started to working on energy planning. And then I realized that actually I'm looking only partial at the partial picture because central to any kind of community or large scale energy planning should be people who are using it. And we have no mechanism in which to include people and communities within the model. So I started looking at um, how to manage that connectivity and that's part of both the projects today. So this is the first one. This is the one that was set in India. And we, um, my, my student was interested in coming to India and working with uh, collaborations that I had at that time with the Indian Institute of Human Settlements, which is in uh, Bangalore. It's a research organization that's at the forefront of working at sustainable development policies. You, you uh, probably heard of them. Um, so here we came there and we said we came with an open mind with respect to what we wanted to do. The only thing broadly my student asked was that he wanted to work on a project that involved communities and large scale planning of energy systems. And uh, the challenge that was presented to us was in relation to um, uh, cooking fuel use, despite the fact that you know there were government schemes at the time that were, that were subsidizing. Um, uh, cylinders, gas stoves, uh, why there was still a significant amount of biomass fuel still being used for cooking in urban India. Um, so, yeah, 
usually, if you were to look at such a challenge, that you know, there's subsidies out there. Uh, why aren't people still transitioning to biomass? Is it because you know there's still enough, not enough uh, income, or is are there any other reasons that um, uh, we need to look into? So. The problem becomes that in the absence of data, and we didn't have data to figure out why this is happening. We could look at uh, Indian census data and um, uh, Indian household uh, level data, but that had limit. That was giving us very limited information about um, cooking fuel use, and especially in relation to where it's being used across urban India. Uh, now we could have used some kind of a utility maximizing model in which the assumption is that as your income increases, your transition to a cleaner fuel, which is more expensive, also increases. Uh, but in reality, people don't behave as predictably or homogeneously. Now, differences in, so the high whole hypothesis was that the differences and uh, in the uptake of uh, uh, clean cooking fuel, or gas in this case, might relate to social factors, might relate to where you are living in, a, in the city, uh, might uh, relate to cultural factors, taste, for example, preference for certain kind of flavor in the food, so practices, and other surrounding priorities. So, um, but this is not something we study as a, you know, in engineering departments. This is not something that we are able to do very well. Uh, we we don't do surveys. We don't know how what, what to do with qualitative data. So even if we knock on the door, uh, the solution is actually not simply saying that okay, let me go work with a social geographer or somebody who's in social science and uh, put together our work because their way of screening information is very different and their outputs look very different. So if you read a paper coming from social science, they, they, they create narratives and they they sort of give you their hypothesis and they support their hypothesis through narrative studies. Whereas what we were looking for is bringing our models, nudging our models closer to where we could accept, uh, they, the models could accept data about how people are living, what their preferences are, etc. So in some sense, the early color television would give a good analogy to what we were trying to do here, which is uh, be able to, uh, it's basically uh, here you're filtering light uh, across red, blue, green. In, in this case, we are using different disciplines, what they, and the information they collect, and we are trying to bring it together to complete a whole picture. Uh, so the whole premise was that we do three layers of analysis. Each layer uses different set of data and different set of assumptions. And the thing that uh, unifies them is the geographical boundaries, uh, to which frame basically the area where they're working on. Uh, and this uh, geographical uh, framing helps to sort of uh, identify and share data across the different layers. Uh, so on the... Uh, Top layer is the quantitative model, and these can use you know, large data sets. So here you would have uh, large quantities of data. Uh, you can do analysis at scale using entire cities, if not countries. But um, it, there's very limited ability to explain uh, in any detail what. So basically, if you were using just the census data or the uh, Indian household survey data. Uh, the second part would be survey data where you can do more, uh, it's also quantitative, you can do uh, use statistical power to make some, um, to test some hypothesis, to infer, to cluster, but it doesn't really capture individual voices. So you still kind of see collective behavior, but not being able to identify anything individual. So it, you know, it, in sense some the things that still can slip through the cracks. And then on the other hand, there's a whole body of researchers who do qualitative field work. They go and painstakingly talk to people and they uh, codify these and that's time consuming and that's costly. 
but and of course it's hard to scale but it brings a different kind of value to the information that you might be getting uh, putting together so I think I mentioned that this was a PhD student so he uh, initially uh, what we started doing was we said okay let's just focus on Bangalore because we had better access there we had IHS who was helping us with the surveys so we carried out some surveys I think it was in the order of 500 uh, surveys across different wards in the city and we used a clustering approach to analyze household um, it interviews and survey data together so basically the po what we were trying to do here was say that not all households um, will benefit from the same solution to help them transition to clean cooking and I'll show you some examples of the outputs from the methods later so can we find clusters where there are different types of barriers and hence different types of solutions will apply. So yeah, so we surveyed 420 um, in households. We used the census data and some sort of publicly available data about uh, Bangalore to select appropriate wards. So we typically selected wards that followed, that were within the same income band and shared a few uh, common features such as uh, uh, appliance ownership and uh, uh, certain uh, other factors and then we looked at uh, basically correlation with income or class one appliance ownership so th these are some of the features that we selected and one of the things that you notice that electricity neither electricity use nor hours of electricity supply LPG use household size how frequently they're paid, whether they get a monthly salary or they're paid weekly. Um, did they receive a free stove because of the government scheme? None of these are very well co correlated with income. And, and that's interesting to see. So, so it's basically, there's a lot of non-income drivers to energy transitions that uh, don't often get, get, their, get themselves into the uh, information that's used to uh, make policy decisions. Uh, then there are some that, for example, um, adequate water supply is, again, you know, class one ownership. It's more correlated with class one ownership, but also to some extent with income. Um, so how is this useful? Uh, so basically what we did was we, used as I said we use statistical clustering to classify households and lifestyles using non-income drivers so these are the features we use to cluster households in a bottom-up manner and uh, what it does is it gives us for example we got five significant clusters uh, one of the clusters let's say let's call it pathway A the, this is characterized by features such as job security, high level of education, living in an established community, legal tenancy, and the barriers to transition that were identified was different saving priorities. They may be prioritizing saving for children's education or lack of uh, LPG shock nearby. Uh, in fact, there's one uh, group that was quite interesting that I haven't put in the presentation was that these were a group of migrant workers, unlike the ones that I'm describing below in pathway B, which was lack of job security, poor house quality, little community support, no legal tenancy. And there the barriers were informal living arrangements, poor access to any kind of infrastructure and community. There was another group that was also a migrant community. And when we compared them to a community which has been like third generation living there, uh, similar income levels but different lifestyles because these are one is a migrant community they've just arrived they have their year to the ground so they were immediately aware of any kind of community scheme that was being offered they would jump on opportunities so they were actually they had transitioned quite easily to clean cooking fuels whereas the 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 second or the third generation despite having higher income level relatively were so entrenched in the lifestyles of their 
previous generations that they, they, were com they were a bit isolated from what was happening around them. So, so that was actually, for me, that was quite an interesting finding. But sticking to these, these two that I put here, uh, the outlook for pathway A would then be that the current subsidy and supply policies are effective at uh, encouraging uptake of cleaner fuels. But what they would probably need is, you know, most of the times there, there wasn't an LPG shop nearby. It's as basic as that. So, you know, often you can supply, apply, um, provide a subsidy, but if the infrastructure for making use of the technology is not there, then you will end up with fuel stacking or rejection of the technology at worst. Um, the outlook for pathway B is that the current subsidy and supply policies were not effective for such households and they had to come up with um, wider utility access for informal settlements, more flexible payment system because one of the things that made a difference was how frequently they were paid and whether they had access to a banking system uh, and support for better housing. So essentially, this is what we wanted to get at. Now, something like this is very di difficult to do at scale, right? So then the next question we asked was that, OK, we did it for Bangalore for a few wards on the basis of being able to do these 420 sur um, surveys and some in-depth uh, questionnaires. But can we scale it? So yes, we can. Um, Basically, what we did was, instead of going and surveying houses, we created a synthetic population of representative households across different regions. And we studied about uh, five cities in southern India. And uh, this is, we used the census table and the household survey microdata to basically create a synthetic population that would be representative of the ward that they belong to. And based, so on that, we have a Bayesian multi-level uh, model where we are able to uh, model individual housing factors as well as community uh, ones using very limited data from uh, different sources. And, and as a result, as an output, what we get is ward-level ward cooking fuel estimates. So, just to give you an example of the kind of outputs you get, so this is one of the uh, wards in Kombitur. Here we have, let's say, let's for example look at two wards, Ward 35, Ward 21. You can see on the scale there, both of them have very low mean monthly LPG consumption. That means that either they're not using it or they're using fuel stacking, um, they're still using biomass. So if we zoom into these two wards and uh, look at them. One of them is, uh, according to our model estimates, what 21 is higher than the city mean with respect to proportion of fuel stacking households, and what 35 is less than the mean. Similarly, if we look at the census um, information, the income for salaried employment in Ward 21 is higher than uh, in Ward 35, but they're still very much below the uh, mean for that city. And similarly, for access to formal banking. So using the information, you can begin to see, even though both these wards are at the same uh, low LPG consumption uh, level, why the, the reason why they might be would could be different, could be because of different reasons, access to uh, banking, access to frequent, frequency of payment uh, with respect to their salary or uh, whether they own a salary job or the type of housing they, they're living in. So all of these can then be uh, analyzed with respect to um, uh, each uh, ward. All of this information is on the footage uh, available for any anybody who might be interested in using it, especially we did, went back and did some workshops with local community groups and uh, policy makers, kind of a very unusual thesis for an engineering student to do, but uh, he passed very well, so there was no, no problem there. There was uh, enough uh, technical work um, underlying the, with respect to the modeling, 
Um, in fact, I would say that it, it was it was quite welcome. In fact, uh, I particularly enjoyed it. I enjoyed working well, with him quite a bit. So what he did was he uh, created a website called Adupu. Even I didn't know, but apparently he spent enough time in Bangalore to know that actually it means a stove in uh, uh, Canada, I think. Or, uh, but um, then what we did was after then COVID happened, and it happened uh, at a time when he was anyways writing his thesis, and then we said, no, we can't leave it at that, because we have studied these five cities, and we used purely synthetic data, so we didn't go and do any surveys in these five cities, and we were wanted to validate our models further. So we said, let's make that effort, and let uh, us go back, and in fact, because this was happening at the time of the COVID, of, of uh, the, uh, the pandemic, we said it also gives us an opportunity to see what impact they might have had. Actually, because we, we went back to Bangalore and we did post-COVID surveys on, on those. So now we have data of, uh, of those same 420 households of pre and post-COVID. And then we also have data on all these other different cities with the surveys that we uh, carried out there. So if anyone wants to use it to uh, do further research, you're more than welcome. I'm going to move on to the next project now that is similar in, in spirit um, and in, in, in terms of application as well, because they're both about energy transitions and decarbonization. But I thought maybe it's a good point to also give you a breather and myself so, you know, otherwise you keep listening all the time to see if you, if I can, I'm happy to take some questions now and before moving on, um, if anyone has any. Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, can we come back to digital twins after? I, I'm happy to take that because I think maybe there's a reason why. Do you do you have a formal way of doing Q and A's? Okay. So digital twins, you want to know more about what I'm doing with digital twins? Is that it? Or uh, what is digital twins? Okay. So. Um, you have a reality, let's say you have a building, you have a heat pump, you have an energy system, anything, and which is observed using sensors and information and operated and controlled, right? You have a building, you want it to operate in a certain way. We need the lights on, we need the mic on here, we are cooling the space. Now, a lot of, the, the, re the reason why this building exists and operates as it does is because some engineer somewhere designed it, and to design it, he, cre he or she created some kind of a model of it, a simulation model, right? A thermodynamic. So let's say if it's a heat pump, it's a thermodynamic model of a heat pump. So you have the reality, and then you have the model sitting side by side, right? One is virtual model. It's an abstraction of the reality, and the other is reality. Now, once you start measuring, let's say you put a lot of sensors in the inlet, outlet, flow rate, etc. of your heat pump. And if you, which we do some, a lot of times, like smart metering and all, all of that. Now if you connect your data to, from the real system and use that to nudge your computer model, your thermodynamic model, closer to reality because it's a thermodynamic model, right? It will just be a representation of the reality, it's not reality. If you nudge your, calibrate your model, or nudge your model closer to reality, and then use the model to do forward predictions and help control the heat pump better, that becomes a digital twin of the heat pump. Now, this can be for anything. It can be for a bridge. You know, if you want, if you can do structural health monitoring, you can have a replica, uh, a finite element model of the bridge that's going back feeding the data back and doing predictive modeling of the load on the bridge. That's basically. So you're twinning the system uh, virtually, making sure it's aligned to the real system and giving it feedback in a continuous loop. That's basically the 
definition. There's a lot of argument around the community with respect to, you know, what's the difference between a digital twin and a controller. Uh, there are some fundamental differences, but the key to a digital twin is this two-way feedback, real-time feedback between the real system and its uh, virtual counterpart. I'm curious, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, so very kind of uh, I'm curious how from energy access really perspective uh, what your study added. So, you know, it's clear this is very interesting, you know, financial access. But how much of it was also huh? and I know from the energy policy space and I work on So you're absolutely right. The starting point did come from the entire body of work that has shown in these that it's often the non-income drivers that uh, guide energy behaviors and any kind of uh, energy transition. Uh, so given that starting point and that hypothesis, the question that we had was that how do you identify then those non-income drivers? The second thing is that you can't presuppose any kind of structure to the relationship between those non-income drivers and um, the outcomes which we are interested in, which is clean cooking transitions. So I think what, if you're asking what's the contribution of this work, one is indeed a methodology by which you can understand uh, energy access spatially. Uh, and in the second case, even without uh, doing uh, too many uh, involved surveys, time consuming surveys. Uh, the second uh, thing I would say is that it's this uh, whole, um, again, methodologically of doing clustering, which does not pre-impose an expectation of uniform groupings of people or number of groupings or how, you know, in the sense that it, it's, it's basically not presuming any uh, uh, groups to emerge. Or, or factors to be important. So I think that was the second thing that uh, we we were uh, keen to show that. Uh, 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 so, and the third thing that I would want to uh, add is that often uh, what we found was that unless you give something tangible, so you know we can keep saying that okay, uh, uh, you know as uh, modelers we worry a lot about the accuracy of our outputs. But I think at the bottom line, we often as engineers and even as uh, people in social science, we are unable to give information to policymakers that they can act upon. The way our, our studies don't translate into effective ways to instrument any kind of policies. And that was something important here. So this Odupu site that we came, that we prepared, we were quite keen to, for people to be able to look into a ward and say, at least, we, okay, let's forget about the fact that people can come and question the accuracy of any kind of model. Let's for now at least give them, based on these underlying set of assumptions, what are we finding out here? Can we find more information about each ward in a manner that's accessible? So that's, I mean, in a sense that that's usually not giving high academic value, but I think it's an important part of uh, every project that we do as engineers or as uh, uh, social scientists to, to look at what, uh, what is it giving to somebody who's your target, like who, what I, um, so, and the other one was, uh, that was important to us, I mean, all, throughout this whole notion of energy access, we were, look, the question that we were asking was how to identify vulnerability. And uh, finally, and this will show up also 
in the next paper that um, my students always come and tell me that okay so just because we are we have the resources and the time to do surveys we are able to find out things but what about areas which are not data rich what about areas that uh, so so we, We've started championing for data democracy. And as much as possible, <coughs> what we do try to do is work with frugal data. And I think that's also another contribution that um, um, is relevant in this, in this case. Apart from the clustering, no, no, that was actually I should have mentioned the we did the entire synthetic population is generated using an agent-based model, which is standard uh, what they do in uh, geography, and we were helped in that area with some geographers. So they they gave we, we didn't do any innovative work in the methodology there. They just said use this, and we used it. No, we, we got samples from these other cities. Uh, yeah. Bayesian model when data is plentiful and when you trust it more. Uh, okay, I didn't mention it. We use the Bayesian modeling framework because A, even though, I mean, 420, it's not such a big data set. But the other resource we have that we could use is that when we were going back, we were talking to a lot of community people. And the whole uh, premise of um, the Bayesian methodology is when you have priors that can inform the data. So we were able to use a process that's called expert elicitation to draw on priors by talking to experts in uh, areas and community heads, basically, so that uh, the data is not just struggling on its own. We are giving some help to the data. Um, yeah, okay. Accuracy of our model, uh, you know, that's, I don't know. I mean, in the sense that they're not rubbish. You know, we've done some ballpark checks. Uh, they're consistent. Hmm? I think they are as, the way I would say it is, if you can get me something more accurate than this, then I would be happy. I think it's as accurate as it is possible given the census data we use is not exactly aligned with the same year. Uh, given some misalignments with the data, this is it. So, so there's no, the, oh, the inaccuracies will arise because of different issues like data sample, year, year of the census data or the IHDS data but not so much from the modeling, I think. The modeling is, you know, it will give you what it will give you. So, so like, you have a large number of population, and from a large number of population, you have selected a very small sample of uh, four million. That's for Bangalore, yes. That's for Bangalore. Yeah. So, uh, if you take the ratio of sample by population, it is a very small. In order of a yeah, but we just took them in certain wards. So we're actually operating at the ward level. <coughs> so we did a few wards, I think four or five wards. So in proportion to the ward level, it's it's okay. Yes. Hello. 
So you talked about the proposition of uncertainty on this data set. So are you using the variability and propagating the variability of 420 household for error estimation or you are using some repeatability or random you know, checks for the propagation? So when we, we propagate, we sample from the uh, uh, outputs. So I can show you that through the context of next because I have some slides on that. Uh, so maybe we can move on to the next and that will answer your question. We use the same thing there. So I'm going to rush through this a little bit now um, uh, because I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, so the next uh, project, it's something that we, I started with a PhD student back in 2009. He graduated in 2013. That was the first iteration. That's when we set the methodology. And then we revived it in uh, more recently in 2022, 21, something like that, uh, into what we call Energy Flex, the flexible approach to local energy modeling. The big difference with, across these two was that initially we started it as a methodology for indeed um, uh, quantification and propagation of uncertainties through large scale models to assess the cost effectiveness of different retrofit options in UK housing. So for example, um, you know, the retrofit options that we were considering were double glazing, a better condensing boiler, um, draft proofing, wall insulation. And we were trying to, uh, basically what we did was we estimated the um, cost effectiveness of each of these using hierarchical Bayesian models. And then uh, back um, uh, more recently, um, we became interested again, I think as a follow-up uh, with experience on working in this project in India, uh, and the more recent push by the government for electrification of heat now. So they want many households to get moved to heat pumps from gas boilers. So again, the question we asked was that <coughs> Is it fit for purpose? Like um, we've studied houses in the past iteration. What about households? So isn't the ability to do retrofit and a good candidate for retrofit as much a function of the house as it is of the household that occupies it? And hence, can we put the two together? So, uh, so here, of course, the motivation is decarbonizing residential energy use. Uh, we want to identify opportunities at scale. So we want to be able to, for example, model the entire country give, given uh, publicly available data because data at household level scale is often not available or it offers limited information. And so we uh, basically came up with a micro simulation based uh, approach to large scale modeling. Uh, and what we are, um, so energy flex can mean many things in the sense if you look up papers on energy flexibility, you will probably come across papers that would be more interesting for Anurag because they will all be about uh, flexibility of moving, shifting demand uh, using storage of some kind. And there's a lot of interesting work being done on that. Uh, here we are talking about flexibility in terms of um, uh, more open approaches to decarbonization that can acknowledge the difference in, of households as well as of houses. So for example, if, if the government is offering, let's say, a flat rate of subsidy to somebody replacing heat pumps to all households, well, some of, sometimes a house may not benefit. In fact, it may, their utility may uh, grow, uh, go up if they transition to a heat pump because their houses are leaky and their radiator sizes are not big enough to sustain a lower temperature heating system. Um, so they would, in fact, lose money. So their house is not ready. A household may not be ready because they uh, have different spending priorities or, or they are renting. So why would you change a whole heating system because you're renting a house? So that we were basically interested in finding that out. This is a slide from 2013. 
a decade ago, and that was my first PhD student who set the methodology. So basically what we do is we cluster houses into subgroups based on age and um, type, like if it's a single, it's a terrace house, detached house, flat, etc. And uh, we basically, for each sub of these clusters, we uh, infer the um, uh, energy use intensity, uh, which is um, kilowatt hours per square meter per year, uh, and a distribution of the uh, intensity using um, uh, Bayesian analysis. And here, what we, so basically, uh, the reason why it's hierarchical is because we have some data that's pertinent to a geographic unit, like a ward. Yeah? And then we have data on uh, from different uh, experts and publications about how the behavior or the consumption of certain types of houses by their age. So we put these together and propagate uh, it to infer the energy use intensity, which gives us the second order uncertainty. And then we sample from the uh, posteriors that we get, the outputs that we get, to define the variability across uh, houses in a region. So basically what we are capturing is the way we are propagating uncertainty. We take the second order and then we sample from it and say that, okay, we understand, for example, a U value may range from 0.5 to 1.2, right? That's because that's the uncertainty around the average value of the uh, U value of the world. But if you have 10 houses and all of them have that level of uncertainty, you will sample from it because all of them may be somewhere different, right? So that's basically um, uh, gathering first uh, order uncertainty. Again, we had an analogy here. Uh, basically, the point was that the way the medical profession operates uh, is you have, let's say, a given population and you evaluate medical procedures with respect to quality of life years as an average effect across population. But you use models where you say that, okay, even though populations can be clustered by ethnicity, by age, by sex, and so on, there will still be so uh, some differences even within uniform clusters, right? None of us, we are all similar, but we are all also different. So that's the same analogy we use here. We say that, okay, medical procedures is equivalent to retrofit options, and quality of life years is equivalent to your energy save. Now, here, again, um, we used uh, public data to create synthetic uh, households for a given local area using a methodology very similar to what we used, except in this case, because we had collaborators who were geographers, they did it, so we didn't have to do it. So they used something better than what we would have done. I don't know what they used, but they gave us the outputs and we were happy. Um, then uh, we use national trends in housing and energy efficiency and model the demand using uh, a quasi steady state model uh, of um, uh, housing and uh, or house and then uh, we tested it using uh, different policy options and solutions uh, so a bit more detail here, so population synthesis using a model that's developed by our colleagues uh, called uh, Spencer, and it uses census data and what is the English housing survey data, similar to the IH, uh, IHDS data. And then um, we estimate the energy use intensity using something called the energy performance certificate data that we now have publicly available and the need data, which is also another housing energy data set in the UK. So this is the basic infrastructure. And then we invite collaboration. So for example, a, 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 a council, a local council in London came to us and said they will give us more high, high granularity data about their housing. We calibrate our model, given their data, and then we can use it to evaluate policies and energy tariffs. Uh, Okay, this is a small side here, I can skip it. We have um, uh, installed or embedded the model into a public domain uh, service uh, in the UK, which is the uh, uh, 
which is the data analytics facility for national infrastructure. Basically, it provides the cloud platform which can host models that are publicly available that everybody can use. Uh, so the user can set model parameters and run it. This is, we ran at least the infrastructure bit for the entire nation. And actually, we found some interesting um, uh, issues there that, of course, there is a correlation between the quality of the house, the energy efficiency of the house that's built. We were only looking at a certain type of house built after two th between 2000 and 2010. And we found a correlation with, of course, income level, but that corresponds to geographic. I don't know if you're aware of the north-south differences, but there is some uh, correlation there. So yeah, so basically, you, then you can go deeper into it to explore uh, spatial inequalities with respect to a particular region. So here we were looking specifically at one particular region in Northeast to explore more about locally where those spatial inequalities may be, and if they correlate with other index, such as index of multiple deprivation or um, presence of uh, social housing. But as I said, one of the local authorities came forward and said, yes, we, will, uh, we would like to test yours. So we look more closely at this local authority because you need some additional data to be able to do so. So it's mostly, you can see that it's a lot of flats here. So we can zoom into the flats and we know uh, the proportion of with respect to when they were built. And so these are model outputs. huh? Um, so we are looking, the retrofit target that we are looking at is an inefficient heating system. And using the, um, our model, which um, uh, with uh, its relevant data sources, we can see which of the, the cluster of half flats, like the age of the flat, has an uh, average or distribution of the boiler efficiency. So here you can see that this one, which is pre-1930s, <coughs> is kind of a flat distribution between 50% to 90% efficient, uh, whereas the ones that were built between 1970 to 2000 actually skewed towards lower end. And that's probably because these probably had their boiler replacement, and these ones are probably the ones where the boilers are coming to end of uh, service or pushed beyond that, in fact. So using a model, we find that older inefficient boilers uh, are more prevalent in the flats that were built between 1930 and 2000, which is a big period, right? What do we do? We change boilers of all the flats that were built between this period. Then we start also looking at their socioeconomic. Uh, uh, characteristics, and we find that the ones that are actually in the 1970s to 2000 flats are also the ones with a lower socioeconomic status and also living in higher percentage of social rentals as, a, as a, uh, against private rentals or owned uh, flats. <coughs> so, based on that, we can say that, okay, the solution is replace boilers with SOC pump. Now, there's a greater prevalence of inefficient boilers in flats within a very large sort of age band, but the households in 1970 to 2000 flats are more likely to need financial support. So the government would be wasting their money if they were to offer a flat 6,000 subsidy. They would be much better off if they gave a bundle to targeted families to also maybe close the gaps, like fix things like draft proofing or the distribution system. Whereas all they need to do is incentivize not owners, but private landlords to upgrade heating. Sweden did that very well, for example. If you, if you, you uh, the landlord is penalized if your heating bill is above a certain value. So there are ways in which one can incentivize um, um, uh, landlords to take the brunt of upgrading uh, and providing uh, uh, more efficient housing. <laughs> okay, so what, again, it's uh, what we learned here is targeting and informing policies in a more nuanced way, including uh, uh, non-technical factors. 
and widening the scope of energy modeling at scale. So being able to do this at the national scale. And again, you know, the issue of data democracy. So working primarily with public available data. Thanks. I'll take some ending questions now. something about the differences in collecting data and protecting data in the two countries, uh, India versus the UK. And could inferences be made from something as supposedly innocuous uh, as energy consumptions in different wards to lifestyle choices being made by individuals? <coughs> surprised at um, how less we teach it within engineering context. This is something routinely, if you're a social science student, you will go through it in your first year, second year. Whereas when I send my students to the ethics committee, it's a, it's still a bit of a challenge, you know, in the sense that this, uh, because normally a lot of the work, if it's to do with observations, it's done in uh, labs or it doesn't involve humans. So here, indeed, it was a learning curve for us. So when I started, I actually knocked on the door of a colleague in uh, social science. So we do have strict rules in place. We do have to go through levels of security uh, um, and ethics check. And uh, we have, uh, you know, sort of, it's, it's becoming better and better and better within engineering. But I think I would really champion for having it more visible to our engineering students because there's so many things that get missed through the cracks exactly like you're saying that you might think oh energy data is innocuous what is, what is it going to do well it can do a lot it can tell how, when somebody is doing what you can infer a lot from energy data of uh, households then how to anonymize data how to protect data there are technologies and mechanisms and systems in place to do that but i think we are not making them that important in engineering uh, and don't even s try to second guess about it the moment you're going out in the field at, in, for data collection just go and get help from your ethics committee and go through the whole whole process of how to protect data how to anonymize it how to s secure it yeah it's it's non-trivial i would say so when we did work in India, we were fortunate because we were working with IHS and they have a very good streamline. They, this is their bread and butter. They do this all the time, so they, so we could do it easily. Uh, with respect to uh, the project we did in the UK, we didn't. Act, we actually used only publicly available data. The only exception was Haringey, and there we did sign NDAs and. Uh, found secure ways of uh, uh, protecting and storing the data. So, yeah, an important point. I have just one question. In case of UK, uh, In case of UK, so uh, you have studied about 1930 to 2000 and 2010 also. So what is the common point? constant in the entire time, in the entire time, which, which has not changed. There are a few things which have changed, but what was the constant? Okay, that's, okay. so when we did this initial study in uh, 2013, we uh, basically focused on Manchester, which is towards the north, and we were looking at, at social housing. So we studied about, uh, two, three thousand social housing units there. And 
no matter which way you looked at it, the, it was very difficult to justify changing uh, to a double glazing in, in the UK. And maybe it was because it, that's, it was the type of housing, you know, you didn't get that much benefit because maybe it's, the, it's social housing, they typically have smaller windows, so, you know, and the biggest uh, advantage you got was draft proofing because the houses were leaky. So in UK, if you, across the board, the first thing you have to do is make sure you're making a house where you can control your ventilation because for heating, you basically you're heating only because you're getting new air. Now you need to ventilate sufficiently, otherwise we would, you know, not be uh, as happy or productive. You need to keep people healthy, so you need to ventilate. But it's it's this unmanaged uh, ventilation that usually creates inefficient uh, heating. Then of course the second big culprit across the board is the fact that we are still using fossil, I mean, we are using gas. And 17 years ago when I came into the UK, the big question was, the big push from the government was CHP, CHPs, combined heat and power plants, like bring power generation closer to the point where humans are using it, so you won't use, lose that much on transmission. And now you see where we are. Now we are saying no, no, no. Th that because CHP is also using basically gas, right? Or so now the entire shift is towards electrification. And that time we were asking them. We were saying that, hey, do you understand the cost of technology lock-in? So two, okay. It's a long-winded answer, but the, the two things that control your ventilation, don't let air leak out, and second is uh, the heating system. So you're working in the area of uh, cities, energy transition, data, decarbonization, maybe electrification as well. So one of the sectors that actually comes to my mind, because I work in that area, is the transport system. So I was just curious whether you have either worked in transport areas at this intersection or you plan to. So uh, you see, that's such a. Uh, when I talk to people who do transport, the, I say the big difference is you're interested in uh, where one is going. I'm interested in where people are. You know, it's like uh, okay. So jokes aside, uh, there there is potential if to our meaning of working with transport if um, the charging becomes integrated with how we are, if charging becomes a player in this energy flexibility mix, etc. But then also, yeah, so yeah, that's one option. Then, uh, when I, uh, about 15, 16 years ago, I, did, I was working with a colleague in transport and what we did was we put, uh, all of our students together, uh, I don't know how, if you're familiar with London, but the area around Paddington Station is quite uh, polluted. So what we were saying was, okay, you know, this is, uh, let's try to find the biggest sources of pollution. And I thought, oh yeah, of course, it's going to be transport, you know, taxis idling. Um, so we put air quality sensors all over the place, around station, uh, around in front of the hospital that's nearby. <laughs> the place that had the most polluting area was the Burger King, even higher than the place where people were allowed to smoke. So, yeah, that was, uh, a, yeah, it was fun to work with them. But then we carried down and I said, okay, let's assume that we clean up all the transport, that all transport be becomes electric. Do, we don't have to worry about pollution anymore, or do we? So uh, what are the other sources of pollution that's generated from buildings, apart from heating? So we did a little exercise of that as well, but yeah. I'm always open to working with uh, uh, people in other disciplines if the question is interesting enough. Now we talked about uh, how we have implemented. Now we talked about how Sweden has implemented uh, 
a penalty for uh, landlords if uh, heating bill is higher than a certain amount. Uh, so, ma'am, like, how do these rules um, navigate the constitutional provisions? Because uh, navigate the constitutional provisions, given as a heating or access to heating is sort of related to um, a right to life. I mean, there must be some uh, equivalent in the Swedish constitution as well. So, how do how are these implemented? Uh, navigating those provisions, and do you think a rule like this can be implemented in India, um, say with things like uh, ground water usage or something like that? Yeah, difficult. That's a, a tough one. Um, well, you see, what we provide is evidence that can be used by uh, people who are in the middle layer between uh, the decision makers and us as academics, right? The civil servants or the uh, people who inform policy makers. So the things we do allow instrumentation of certain policies or actions that can be then implemented into even laws. And that's, I mean, it's difficult to, uh, uh, I mean, th there's a whole lobby, right, of um, private landlords, which is very strong. And uh, political, politically, things move. And uh, ultimately, you know, it's what will get them the votes, not what will get them get people. You know, so, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say. Um, so, I mean, uh, you consider the issues in a building. There are like a lot of components, like there's electricity, ventilation, plumbing, and all that. So, whenever you're focusing on a particular problem, you have to work with a large data set, and there's a lot of work that goes into it. Do you think that if uh, we transition more into building information modeling, that would make it more convenient for a more cross disciplinary action? Um, maybe, but I mean, building information modeling has come, has progressed quite fast, no? And it's become quite established in the sense, and in fact, it's it's used much more, e it's usable. You know, people are using it, and they are using it to share information across construction projects. It's standard now in the A -E AEC sector. And I think it's also going to play a pivotal role in this whole digital twin development of infrastructures. One thing I've always struggled with is that building information modeling is uh, it's data with some semantics, right? <coughs> with, with, a, with its own ontology. Um, it, it doesn't always map very efficiently when you're trying to do these cross-disciplinary mm -hmm. projects because it doesn't always have flexible attributes that you know you can you know for, so for example for energy modeling if I go to BIM I will only get information about the physical attributes and maybe in more detail than I need for modeling at scale so it, it's, yeah, uh, uh, maybe I haven't found an efficient way of working with them, but somehow, yeah, it's, uh, it's not been something I have looked into very deeply. So ma'am, uh, I am curious to know uh, why your PhD student wanted to come to India and Bangalore, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and how difficult it was for uh, the team. No, you had a collaboration, but how difficult to uh, talk to the local people because they have a yeah. barrier to the local language. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my student wasn't really uh, keen on India. He was keen on working on um, social logic, what we decided to call in a dialogue while discussing. I think he was interested in the social logic of energy. So he came to me because he's interested in energy. But he is saying that I'm interested in the non-technical drivers and issues that uh, uh, surround energy. And so we 
called it social logic of energy. It's, it comes from space syntax because you know they call it the social logic of space. Anyways, so I had collaborators at IHS at that time. I was talking to, I was you know uh, a person there who is uh, doing some very interesting work, and so I, I said, okay, I I cannot I can offer to take you to India, and he jumped on it. He said, yeah, I, I want to come. So so I brought him here. With re so a very good point about how a person like that can. You know, I've seen people, I've seen my colleagues bringing their students to India and sometimes, you know, other countries. And then the students are completely caught off guard because it's a completely different context, right? There's a different nuance, understanding. I was lucky because the student of mine, um, he was just like fish in water. You know, he, he's not Indian by background. And uh, so he basically has a social intelligence that, that worked in his favor over here. But he also had a, a very welcoming team at IHS. They gave him full support. They also made sure you know, that he didn't do anything silly like going and doing surveys himself. We were always with a community uh, uh, head. He was always with somebody because he didn't speak the local language, right? Uh, so. But they helped him a lot. He helped also uh, by get, you know, receiving help in the appropriate manner. So it kind of worked out and uh, worked out quite well in the sense that I would say that he probably now understands, yeah, he, he's permanent friends with people there. He goes back, and, you know, it's, uh, so I was lucky, I would say. And uh, I want to ask that uh, regarding experimental or numerical interpretation from your data, you told from uh, energy efficiency point of view, you did a modeling, numerical modeling, basically. Regarding experimental, what is different from Indian perspective view and from UK perspective view? So the question is, how is experimental work different? Yes, because of Climatic conditions are different, so how is it different from here? And uh, uh, the temperature varies uh, very much from here. So how it will uh, modeling uh, differs from that? Well, the modeling will capture the... I, I, I Is uh, uh, for global perspective or only from uh, you scale point of view, I am asking? From the scale point of view that, you know, whatever modeling or measuring you're doing, you have to take into account local factors. And if you're working with energy, inevitably you have to take into account, even in UK, we have to take into account local differences in climate. So we work with, you know, with respect to modeling, we work with relevant weather files that uh, would give us the suitable boundary conditions. Uh, I'm not sure if I interpreted your question correctly, but uh, you tell me if you're happy with the, if I answered it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, another question. Uh, what happened uh, um, to some of the models you build when you have a change, uh, you know, sort of <coughs> model changing event like the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. And um, what do you do, like you, you alluded to uh, census data in India being dated. Uh, and how, I mean, how much of that is going to affect not just the engineering problem, but also the policy Mm -hmm. recommendations that you go forward when we're in 2024 and the census should have concluded in 2021 mm -hmm. and we're not even started on uh, you know the processes of getting that whole engine going yeah yeah so indeed uh, as I think it was brought up earlier in relation to accuracy these kind of assumptions that we are making of sensors etc does sort of make its way then into the models uh, so we, they will be the outputs will reflect 
what we gave as inputs and if we are giving a census data that's 10 years and if there's a significant change in the demographic makeup then it, it would, it's likely to affect. Uh, so for example in these wards if there's a high one indicator would be that if there's a high influx let's say of migrant communities then so I am I mean something like COVID represents what we call shocks to a system and there are sort of ways in which people model that, those. Um, it doesn't necessarily change the nature of the model because uh, the model st structure is representing, a, let's say, an object or energy system <coughs> or a building. How it's used is a big difference. And indeed, when uh, uh, I was showing it to Anurag earlier, but I work with our university buildings to death, like, you know, in the sense that we, because they give us data very generously and it's good quality data. So there we see the effect. That's the one place where I've been able to see that whole blip during the uh, lockdown years and in terms of suddenly the shapes of energy looking very different. But then I looked at it, I said, okay, what's the longer term effect? And I haven't seen anything significantly different in uh, Cambridge in our buildings but I think that's wrong because what hasn't changed is the way we operate the buildings which is that a a I'm not deciding when to heat my office somebody else's so the utility curve still looks the same as it did pre-COVID but in reality it's actually very different because I used to go into my office physically about three, four times a week and work from home once. Now it's the opposite, but that's not recorded because um, you know my office is still consuming even though I'm not there. So yeah. So probably we will need to f find other mechanisms to absorb those effects. And maybe we also need to change the way we control buildings. Maybe it's quite dated. Maybe. Thank you.